Hi, I'm Dana Witkowski, Engagement Specialist at the Columbia Museum of Art. On behalf of the CMA, I am so excited to welcome you to a virtual evening with the Gorilla Girls. The Gorilla Girls are a feminist, activist, artist collective committed to fighting injustice in the arts. They create works of art that reveal the understory, the subtext, the overlooked, and the downright unfair. The Gorilla Girls believe in an intersectional feminism that fights discrimination and supports human rights for all people and all genders. This program is part of the Justice Theme Semester in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina. Support for this program comes from the College of Arts and Sciences, the Knight Foundation Fund at the Central Carolina Community Foundation, the Elizabeth M. Marion Visiting Artist Fund at the School of Visual Art and Design, and the Columbia Museum of Art. Be sure to stick around for a Q&A session to follow. Please welcome Frida Kahlo. What's very good about our image is that when you look at our masks, you think of what we stand for. And we stand for the conscience of the art world. And we feel that there, there is underrepresentation of women and minorities. And when you see our logo, basically, when you see our face, that's what we stand for, and it's not personal. <laughs> Women artists have never gotten the serious attention and certainly not the serious money that male artists do. Why? The Gorilla Girls, who call themselves the conscience of the art world, have plastered their answer all over town. Coming into the city right now, probably 65% of the young artists are females. And yet, less than 10% have their work shown. And that's one of the reasons I'm a girl. We believe that getting into a gallery or being shown in a museum even is for an artist an employment situation. The question was, how are you going to get women artists recognized when names, lives committed to art was completely ignored by the art history books? And so some of what we did was just attention getting. anonymous do-gooders like Robin Hood, Batman, Zorro, and the Lone Ranger. Most of the women who are doing all the bitching are completely talentless, which certainly look like the top women artists. You don't hear them making these embarrassing feminist pleas. I mean, it's just that most women, are, they don't have any talent, and they're taking it out on men. Everybody who attended the Museum of Modern Art this year went up to the information desk and said, gee, where are the women artists? They put them on the walls. Hey everyone, I'm Frida Kahlo and I'm very concerned with the protection of my masculinity. And that's why tonight I'm wearing this mask to protect myself and everyone around me. But since we're socially distanced by hundreds of miles, I'm going to safely remove it. 
And I hope you all follow the same guidelines. I'm one of the founders of the Gorilla Girls, and I've been involved in just about everything you're going to see tonight. And I'm so happy to welcome you all to this, our second Gorilla Girl virtual gig. And thanks for your patience with all the funny little technical glitches that come along with this stuff. Anyway, let's all give it up for USC and Columbia Museum of Art. Now, these are really tough times all over the world. Demagogues, dictators, domestic terrorists, white nationalists are all on the rise. In the midst of a deadly pandemic, immense economic hardship and cataclysmic climate change. The lies are endless and the racism, inequality, police violence, hate speech, corruption, and death get worse every day. Is anyone out there as nervous as I am about the upcoming election? Should we start out tonight with one huge collective scream into our computer screens? Everybody ready? Warn your housemates. One, two, three. Ah! Oh, didn't that feel good? Let's Here's a poster that we did in 2016, right after the election of Donald Trump. We were thinking about how Americans commemorate the heritage and struggle of marginalized groups during certain times of the year, and how it might change under a President Trump. Now, the Guerrilla Girls are known for political humor, and this poster seemed ironic in the aftershock of the election. But four years in, it's not very funny anymore because a lot of this is really happening. Here's a short video we made this summer to document our participation in some protests. And it's not very funny either. Okay, let's skip ahead to something that we can do something about this year's election. It just happens to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which in theory gave women the right to vote. But we know that the early suffrage movement was rife with racism and indigenous people on whose occupied lands we all stand right now didn't get the vote until much later. Black and brown votes continue to be suppressed and many states still take away voting rights permanently from anyone who has been incarcerated. But this year, let's all vow to be vigilant and work in whatever way we can to make sure that universal suffrage for all Americans is a reality and that every vote is counted. But let's move on to our creation story. Imagine it's 1985. 
you're a female artist in New York. And when you look around, you see that almost all the opportunities in the art world are going to white men. Imagine the Museum of Modern Art opens a survey of international art with 169 artists and only 13 women and eight artists of color. <clears throat> you go to a protest outside the museum and you realize that no one going into the museum even cares. You ask yourself, what would it take to break through this misconception that the art system is a meritocracy in which all of the critical filters, the curators, the dealers, the critics, and especially those wealthy art collectors always know what's best. Imagine right then and there, you decide you must find a way to show that art history is incomplete without including all the voices that make up our large, teeming, diverse, and beautiful culture. So you dream up a new kind of street poster, an unforgettable in-your-face poster meant to wake people up. You call a meeting of some equally angry friends. You choose to be anonymous. You name yourselves Gorilla Girls. You decide to wear gorilla masks. And you take the names of dead women artists as pseudonyms. In a couple of weeks, you're sneaking around New York in the middle of the night, carrying stacks of posters and buckets of blue. These posters hanging around art galleries ignite a public discussion about racism, sexism, and eventually corruption in the art world. <clears throat> Over 60 individuals come in and out of the group. They're cis, lesbian, transgender, they're diverse in age, sexual orientation, economic class, and from many ethnic backgrounds. South Asian, Asian, African American, Latinx, European, etc. Hundreds of posters, billboards, street banners, stickers, and books follow, <clears throat> not just about the lack of diversity in art, but also in film, politics, and pop culture. Then come street projects in cities all over the world, like Rotterdam. Mexico City, Istanbul, Athens, Shanghai, and recently in Kochi, India, at the first international Biennale, the Kochi Biennale, with over 50% women artists and a tiny minority of artists from Europe and the US. Then there are exhibitions in Montreal, London, Bilbao, Madrid, Germany, Sweden, Auckland, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Argentina, Sao Paulo, Quito, Peru, Bucharest, Romania, and even right here in South Carolina. Yo, New York City, what are you waiting for? You know, we love doing this work and feel so lucky to have been able to do it for so long. We are so grateful to the thousands of people all over the world, ages eight to 80, who write to us and tell us that we have inspired them to do their own crazy kind of activism. Our first two posters targeted fellow artists and their galleries. Next, we went after museums, critics, the New York Times. Whenever we put up new posters, we would lurk around the streets nearby, overhear what people had to say about them and get ideas for the next ones. This is an example of how bad things were. We were complaining because there weren't 15% this or 13% that, 50% whatever. We were complaining about zero, zero, one, and zero. And it was harder for women artists of color. So we did this early intersectional poster. Actually, it, it sort of introduces something we picked up later, which was the idea of tokenism. But going back, soon the word on the, week, the street was that the Gorilla Girls were a bunch of whining complainers. So negative. 
we took this criticism to heart and decided to do a poster to help artists be more positive about their situation. The advantages of being a woman artist. Every one of us has our own special favorite advantages. And I'm kind of split between being included in revised versions of art history and knowing that whatever kind of art you do, it will be labeled feminine. And of course, our all time group favorite, getting your picture in the art magazines wearing a gorilla mask. <clears throat> we, we're pretty sure you have your own favorite too. This poster has been translated into many languages and hardly a week goes by that we don't get letters from people in fields as diverse as veterinary medicine, music, physics, cartooning. We even got a letter from someone studying mortuary science telling us that this poster is the story of their lives too. Now, a few years later, we were invited to do a billboard in Manhattan and we decided to try this crazy voice out that we had developed on a larger audience. So one Sunday, we went to the Metropolitan Museum to count naked bodies in the artworks and we discovered a whole lot more. In the 19th and 20th century sections of the museum, that part of our, the time in art history when sex replaces religion as the major preoccupation of European male artists, we found this shocking statistic, which prompted us to ask this question. Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And we had to back it up with this facts. 5% of the artists in the modern art section are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. Now, we like to think that our work has changed the way curators think. So we went back to the Met a couple of years ago just to see what had changed. And this is what we found. Fewer women artists, but more naked males. Should we be satisfied with this as progress? By the mid 1990s, the buzzword in the US art world had become multiculturalism. Art institutions everywhere were playing catch up, showing one or two artists from each of the marginalized groups they had previously excluded. But what we noticed is that most museums ended up showing the same small handful of artists over and over again. So we decided to do a campaign about tokenism, <clears throat> the practice of exhibiting one woman artist, one artist of color, one gay or trans artist, and then considering the problem of diversity solved. We wanted to ask a larger question. Is tokenism a solution or a continuation of the problem of exclusion? And every one of these things happened to members of our group. And each of us has our favorite. Mine is, is um, this one. At parties and openings, everyone ends up telling you their interracial, gay, or transgender sexual fantasies. Over the last decade, we have been busier than ever, but we've been, we've been faced with a huge dilemma. What do you do when the system that you've spent your whole life attacking suddenly embraces you? In 2005, we were asked to do a large scale installation at the Venice Biennale. Now we agonized over the invitation, but in order to get our message out, we decided to participate with the understanding that we could criticize the Biennale right on its own walls. And that was a thrill. Here's what we did. <clears throat> a series of 17 foot high banners that were at the very entrance of the group show in the Arsenale. First, we took on the Biennale itself. We wanted to document 110 years of discrimination. 
but we also wanted to declare it the first feminist Biennale. Why? Because in all of the years of the Venice Biennale, there had never been any women directors until then. This was the first show ever organized by women. And surprise, it, it had the highest number of women artists ever. Then we took on the historic museums of Venice because they all did have work by women in their collections, but where was it kept? Not in the galleries, it was all in the basements. So we made fun of them with this poster based on the iconic Fellini film, La Dolce Vita. And we asked the question, where are the women artists of Venice? Underneath the men. And then in the small print, we encouraged um, all the viewers to go to the museums of Venice and tell the directors they wanted to see more women on top. In 2008, the Washington Post gave us a full page as part of a special section on feminism and art. We designed this tabloid to reveal the shocking, shocking truth about the low, low number of women artists and artists of color in the US National Museums, supported by taxpayer dollars on the mall in Washington. And it was to include the fact that at the time, the National Gallery of Art didn't have one artwork on display by an African-American artist. So when the Post called to fact check this, <clears throat> the National Gallery went bananas, then called back the next day to say that, oh, the Post was mistaken because just overnight, we were in the process of installing a Martin Currier sculpture. By the way, this is how bad things were at our taxpayer supported museums in Washington as recently as 10 years ago. The National Gallery of Art, 98% male and 99.9% .9 white because of one sculpture. Tokenism at its finest. We've noticed that lots of museums have the names of dead white male artists inscribed on their facades. And we've always wondered, maybe that's part of the problem. So our solution is replacing names like Leonardo and Michelangelo with artists like Artemisia Gentileschi, Rosa Bonheur, Alma Thomas, Frida Kahlo, and Claude Cahoon. <clears throat> now, speaking of Claude Cahoon, we wrote about Claude in our bedside companion to the history of Western art. Claude Cahoon lived in France in the mid 20th century and made self portraits in all manner of gender roles. Claude was born Lucy Schwab, Claude's life partner and step sibling, Suzanne Malherbe, also named himself Marcel. Some books on surrealism list Claude as a man, others as a woman. We think art history needs some new vocabulary to describe artists like Claude Cahoon. Now, don't get the wrong idea. We love art and artists, but let's face it, the art world has some pretty dark corners. There are collectors and curators and donors, all the tastemakers who do advocate for a fair and diverse art world. But at the same time, the art world is filled with money launderers, smugglers, tax dodgers, inside traders, museum board members with shady business associates, and a few criminals. In fact, the art market is unregulated. It's described as the fourth largest black market in the world. And that's after drugs, guns, and diamonds. No wonder there's so much nefarious stuff going on. <clears throat> and US museum boards are not filled with art experts. They're actually run by super rich trustees, many of whom are also art collectors who get big tax write-offs for their donations, as well as in 
inside information about which artworks are likely to increase in value. A tad corrupt. Looking closer, lots of these trustees make their money in some not so nice industries like fossil fuels, for-profit prisons, manufacturing opioid drugs, ma manufacturing weapons of state control like tear gas and rubber bullets, and even securitizing your ever mushrooming student loans. Collecting art and giving money to museums, art washes some of the questionable ways these people make their wealth. But more about that later. First, <clears throat> let's take a short art quiz. What does art by famous females cost compared to art by famous males? Everyone, just try to guess the percentage. 14%, shocking. The highest auction sale ever for a living female artist, $12.4 million for a Jenny Seville painting, which happened to be of a nude female, was only 14% of the record price of 90.3 million paid for a David Hockney. Can you make money from a museum while you're on its board of directors? $11 million says yes, because that's what Count Giuseppe Panza was paid for selling part of his art collection to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles while he was on the board. He also sold other work, artwork that year from his collection to the Guggenheim for $30 million. What's one of the major economic forces behind the Guggenheim Museum in Abu Dhabi? Debt bondage. Foreign workers at the luxury zone, which includes the Guggenheim, are hired in South Asia and flown to the Emirates. When they arrive, their passports are confiscated and their pay is nothing like what they were promised. They're forced to live in inhumane conditions like in this photograph. This is a real tough one. <clears throat> What's more important to the Metropolitan Museum than free speech? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Money. The Met accepted $65 million from the ultra right-wing Koch brothers, those billionaire oligarchs who spent even more than that trying to undermine US elections. And what did the Met do after getting this money? Well, they held a big party and then called in the cops to arrest a bunch of artists who projected this image onto the museum during the party tagging the Cokes as climate change deniers, which in fact they are. Now, while we're speaking of billionaires, here's a sticker campaign we did in New York in 2015. We went after art collectors, galleries, and museums for their complicity in income inequality. There's a picture of it taken right outside the Museum of Modern Art. Then we turned it into an uninvited projection on the facade of the Whitney Museum in New York with the help of the Illuminator Collective. And here's a video that they showed of it. So the world of artists is great, but the art world sucks. The super rich are controlling the museums, sitting on the boards. Power is being centralized into these few rich people like it's really about the one percent unfortunately the art world right now appears to be about money and about the production of luxury items billionaires are making more and more and more their taste controls which artists get the big bucks and get the opportunities and get the shows planning to sneak around New York with the Illuminator. So we'll be starting out in Chelsea and we hope to then go to the Whitney. So we had this idea to do something we could do 
really fast around New York and put these stickers up. Some of the stickers are about art galleries, about billionaires, billionaire collectors, and about museums. So we wanted to put them up where they belong, on the big galleries, on the museums, and give them out to people, especially so they could do the same thing. And it seemed like a great idea. Call the people together, just put the word out, see who comes, and just run around the streets and put these things up and bother people. It's going to be a Saturday in Chelsea. People walking around, feeling really good about having seen all this inspiring art. And all of a sudden, they're going to see the wall above start talking to them. And it's going to say, dear art collector, we completely get. Collecting art is so expensive. We really understand why you can't afford to pay all your employees a living wage. The wall is going to talk to them. Every time we put something up, you know, people would throw bananas. Some people would love it. Some people would hate it. So we would sort of work in that space. It's really very productive to provoke people to think about things. And we discovered early on that if you could make someone who disagreed with you laugh, then you have a hook inside their brain. You know, once you were in there, you just might be able to change their minds about things. Well, I guess you've figured it out. We believe that museums could use some new work ideas. <clears throat> so in 2016, we created the first ever Guerrilla Girls Complaints Department at Tate Modern Museum in London. And over a week's time, Thousands of people came to complain about art, gender issues, racism, politics, and the museum itself. Our complaints department traveled to Brazil the following year, and here's where we really want to install it. And speaking of the power of collective complaining, the past few years have witnessed protests that have forced museums to make some ethical decisions. And here are some examples of protests that we have participated in, but have been organized by other artist collectives. The museum agreed to refuse, the Guggenheim Museum agreed to refuse money from the Sackler family that manufactures and pushes opioids. Warren Canders, who manufactured the tear gas used on the refugee children and families at the Mexican border, was forced to resign from the board of the Whitney Museum. <clears throat> and there have been demonstrations at MoMA to divest itself of prison stock and to expel board member Larry Fink, whose hedge fund is heavily invested in student debt derivatives and also for-profit prisons. He hasn't resigned yet, but we're still working on it. We look at, this, look at it this way. If the wealthiest country in the world is stuck with a system where the only way to fund culture is through philanthropy from the very rich, then maybe institutions should only accept funding from individuals whose businesses make the world a better, not a worse place. In terms of changing museum culture, this past spring, museum employees have started this Instagram account, Change the Museum, to tell their anonymous stories of racism, sexism, and harassment in the workplaces they know the best. And all of these developments have convinced us to revisit this code of ethics for art museums, which we made in 1989. We updated it and turned it into a monument that we think should travel around to museums everywhere. Here it is as we imagine it living in the sculpture garden at MoMA 
And this actually appeared in a magazine spread recently. We use the publication to call out museums that have used the pandemic to break unions, unions that have demanded living wages and decent benefits for their staff. At the same time, museum directors make million dollar salaries. And here it is living in the Cuff Plaza at the Met. And you might notice that it is written in biblical language. Allow me to read the final commandment. Thou shalt admit that if thy museum does not show art or hire staff as diverse as the culture thou claimest to represent, thou art not showing the history of art, you're merely telling the story of wealth and power. But let's step away from the art world for a minute and look at an industry that can be just as bad. Hollywood. Even though the film industry wants to think of itself as edgy and progressive, if you look closely, there's really not enough diversity. So for several years, we rented billboards in Hollywood just a few blocks from where the Academy Awards are held and during the time that the Academy Awards were given. And in 2002, we decided it was time to put a little realism into the Academy Award. So we redesigned the Golden Boy to look a little bit more like the guys who took him home. Now, that was the very year that Denzel Washington and Halle Berry won Oscars for their performances. Sometimes we like to joke that maybe our billboard had something to do with it. And here's an update of the same poster that we did in Minneapolis in 2016 at the height of the Oscar So White campaign. So much fun to recycle these things. And <clears throat> last year, we updated this 1999 sticker that compared Hollywood to the Senate, only to realize that while the Senate has actually improved a little bit, Hollywood has actually gotten worse. And here's something that we did about another pressing social issue. It's a street post that we did in Montreal about misogyny and violence against women that appeared on the 20th anniversary of the worst mass murder ever in Canada when a gunman claiming he was fighting feminism killed 14 women studying engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. Our poster is a pretend graffiti wall of sexist hate speech through the, the centuries. And it includes quotes from Confucius who said that 100 women are not worth a single testicle. To Pat Robertson, the evangelist preacher who said feminism is a socialist anti-family movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. It struck us that it's still okay to publicly say things about women and trans women that wouldn't be said, tolerated or said about other groups. Case in point, Donald Trump, who brags about grabbing women by the genitals, calls them fat pig slobs, dogs, disgusting animals, and, and uh, low, low IQ dogs. He is particularly cruel and racist towards women of color. And this brings us to some of our latest projects because close to half of all women and many men and trans people have been sexually harassed and or abused in the workplace and on the street. And it happens in the art world too. <clears throat> we realize that museums need some help talking about artists who are also sexual predators. So let's set the stage. Here is the official portrait of President Bill Clinton at the National Portrait Gallery in DC. And it was painted by an artist who like Clinton has been accused of sexual abuse. 
should the portrait gallery say about this interesting coincidence? Well, we're offering them a couple of ways out. Here are three ways to write a museum wall label when the artist is a sexual predator. Option number one, don't mention it at all. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Option number two, mention it a little bit. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Like many artists, he has had a few disgruntled employees. Number three, be straight up honest. Chuck Close has had a huge career with Crisis to Match. He's been accused of sexually abusing models and students he picks up at fancy art schools. How fitting and ironic that he <clears throat> he painted the official portrait of Bill Clinton. The art world tolerates abuse because it believes art is above it all and rules don't apply to genius white male artists. Wrong. This project has caused all hell to break loose. It has been politely turned down again and again for exhibition. And last fall, we put up this poster on a phone booth right outside the newly renovated Museum of Modern Art when it had the nerve to reopen after an elaborate renovation with two galleries, two new galleries, named for donors with close and unexplained ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein, by the way, used the art world for years to art wash his criminal behavior, trafficking underage girls. He even picked up some of his young victims at art schools. And this brings us to our latest project, which we are so excited about, and it will premiere in London as soon as it is safe to travel internationally. And here it is. What do art historians call the macho, hetero, predominantly white male perspective in European and American art that depicts women as sexual objects for the pleasure of male viewers? The male gaze. But the gorilla girls call it the male grays. There are lots of naked women in post-colonial Western art. Sleeping in the backyard, splayed out on beds, lounging around with their friends, bathing, dancing, hooking up, being harassed, abducted, bound, raped, and murdered. When we looked into how some revered male artists used and abused women in their real lives, we saw more than gazing, we saw grazing. So the question we wanna ask is, does life imitate art or art imitate life? Gauguin abandoned his wife and five children to become primitive in the Caribbean and South Pacific. He married a succession of teenage girls as young as 13. He died of syphilis at 55 and probably gave it to many of them. European colonialism at its finest. Of the women who had long-term relationships with Picasso, two died by suicide, two had nervous breakdowns, and one escaped and wrote about it. In 1950, sculptor Dorothy Daner decided her husband, sculptor David Smith, had hit her once too often. She loaded her pickup truck and took off for New York to start a career of her own. Smith turned around and married one of his young students. According to the book Ninth Street Women, Hans Hoffman's summer school in Provincetown was a harem, and Hoffman, the bull elephant who patted his female students on the ass and fucked everything that moved. Lucien Freud admitted to having 14 children by 12 different women. He may have fathered twice as many. He said women go downhill at the age of 16. 
Sir Lawrence Gowling, principal of the slave school, pimped for Freud, admitting young girls to the art school who had caught Freud's eye. Chuck Close invited his female students from Yale to his studio to sit for portraits. Portraits. The ones who refused to undress were given $100 and told to leave. The ones who stayed endured prying questions about their sex lives while posing naked. Get ready for the male graze. The gorilla girls take on our culture's enduring love affair with bad male behavior and art. We're preparing a new project for the courtyard of Somerset House for Art Night 2021. We hope to see you there. It just might change the way you think about art forever. What do art has... Okay, thank you. Um, let's close the evening on a positive note. The School of the Art Institute of Chicago invited us to deliver the commencement address to the class of 2010 in front of thousands of cheering students and some angry parents. We gave the graduates some surprising and unexpected advice. And afterwards, we turned our manifesto into this video. And here it is. The Gorilla Girls Guide to Behaving Badly, which you have to do most of the time in the world as we know it. Be a loser. The world of art doesn't have to be an Olympics where a few win and everyone else is forgotten. The art market and its hyper-competitive celebrity culture makes everyone but the stars feel like failures. But there's another world out there that's not about raging egos, a world of artistic cooperation and collaboration. That's the one we join and we invite you to join it too. Let's make trouble together. Be crazy. Political art or activism that points to something and says, this is bad, is just preaching to the converted. Instead, try to change people's minds and do it in some unforgettable way. A trick we learn is humor helps you fly under the radar. If you can get people who disagree with you to laugh at an issue, you have a hook right into their brain. Once there, you have a much better chance to convert them. Be anonymous. Sometimes you gotta speak out publicly, but sometimes it works even better to speak out anonymously. Now this has its disadvantages, like working your whole life without getting any credit, but it has lots of advantages too. Our anonymity, for example, keeps the focus on the issues and away from our personalities. The mystery of who we might be draws lots of attention to the issues we promote. Plus, you won't believe what comes out of your mouth while wearing a gorilla mask. Be an outsider. Even if you're working inside the system, we say act like an outsider. Seek out the understory, the subtext, the overlooked, and the downright unfair. Then expose it. Jam your culture. Remake your institution. Just do one thing. If it works, do another. If it doesn't, do another anyway. Don't be paralyzed if you don't get it right every time. Just keep chipping away. We promise that bit by bit, your efforts will add up to something effective. Artists, don't make only expensive art that billionaire art collectors can afford. Curators, don't exhibit only the expensive art your trustees donate. Let's have more cheap art that everyone can own, like books, zines, music, and movies, like our posters. Show museums tough love. It's unethical that wealthy art collectors who invest lots of money in art can become museum trustees, overseeing institutions that in turn validate their investments. It's a lousy way to write and preserve our history. Demand ethical standards inside museums. No more conflicts of interest or insider trading. No more cookie cutter collections of art that cost the most. Convince art collectors their collections are inferior with only work by white male artists. Don't let museums perpetuate this version of art and power with a few tokens thrown in. Make sure your favorite museum casts a wider net and collects the whole story of our culture. Whether you work in a museum or a classroom, don't teach an art history constructed by corrupt institutions. Do like we did. Write your own. Complain, complain, complain. Be a creative complainer. Be a professional complainer. Don't assume people know what's missing from museums. Remind them how many modern and contemporary art collections still contain less than 15% females and artists of color. Use the F word, feminism. 
We think it's crazy that so many people who believe in the tenets of feminism are still afraid to call themselves feminists. Feminism doesn't get the respect it deserves. Women's rights, civil rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, and Black Lives Matter are the great human rights movements of our times. Feminists like us who believe in intersectionality fight for all human rights. No one is free until everyone is free. Feminism is changing the world. It's revolutionizing human thought, given many people lives their great-grandparents could never have imagined. But there's still so much work to do. There are so many countries worldwide where LGBTQ people and women have little or no human rights. 90% of transgender employees have faced discrimination or harassment at work. In the U.S., no federal law protects them, even though nearly 80% of voters support such a law. Then there's rampant sexism in the tech industry, including the harassment of female gamers. And what about the gender earning gap that the U.S. Congress refuses to move against? Violence and abuse against women, gay and transgender people is still a huge international problem. From gang rape in India to kidnappings in Nigeria to sexual slavery by ISIS to the negligible punishment given out for domestic violence in America. Trans women are assaulted and even murdered in the U.S. But despite all this bad news, feminist resistance movements are exploding all over the world. Let's make the F word feminism the F word for the future. Let's all join together with feminists on the right side of history. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and especially with these weird little glitches and you only saw half of them. Uh, anyway, now it's time for your questions. But first, I'd like to announce that this very week, our latest book just came out. It's a picture book. Here it is, The Art of Behaving Badly. And it includes just about everything you saw tonight and even more. So please check it out on our website, therealgirls.com. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dana. And... Um, Yes, we will be able to ask some questions. All right. Well, thank you, Frida, so much for this fantastic gig. We are so um, lucky to have you with us this evening. And I want to thank everybody who's with us tonight. Um, this has just been such a really cool treat. And we are so grateful that y'all have joined us this Friday evening. So we have a couple of really great questions. Um, oh, can everybody hear me? First of all, I have to ask you, did anyone hear my dog barking? <laughs> anyway, that's sort of one of the wonders of working from home. <laughs> We've got a very special person in our audience or animal. <laughs> All right. So the first question is, how do you see your work as part of the continuum of activist art from the 90s to today? Uh, well, we, we just do see it as part of a continuum. When we first started, I think the art world was living on a hangover of formalism. And there was this idea and it was, it, it was even taught in schools that art had nothing to do you know, with politics. I remember one of my professors who was an abstract expressionist, second or third generation, looking at me and saying, you'll never change the world with your art, so just get used to it. Um, and I think that bit by bit, um, I think that's really wrong. I mean, art, especially modern art in the 20th century, has been profoundly political, uh, especially in Europe. Um, and I think it's just taken a while for the art world to get past that. And of course, the art market doesn't want to think that art's too political because, um, you know, wealthy collectors want something neutral to put behind, you know, to hang behind their sofas. Great answer. All right. So we've got, um, Frida, how much time do you think we have for these Q and A's? Cause I keep getting a, a bunch of really great ones. I just hey, want I've got the whole evening. <laughs> as long right. as my dog doesn't, uh, well, anyway, you can see my dog. She's good. <laughs> All right. So we've got another question. Um, so the gorilla girls have been a group since 1985. How do you measure the success of your activist work? Well, I, I don't really do that too much. I just think ahead um, rather than behind. And, you know, these you should also realize that every gorilla girl would give you a different answer to these questions. Um, I think that we were instrumental in uh, making it impossible 
for uh, critics and curators and historians to think that the history of art could be written with only the work of white males. Um, uh, I think that that, that is probably uh, the thing I'm most um, proud of. And I think this new work we're doing with the male grays, um, I'm hoping that it'll take that a little bit further. It's hard to go into to a museum right now and not start to count how many women and how many artists of color there are being shown. And we were part of the movement that created that awareness. Uh, I'm hoping with the male grays that we will start to see how um, sexual assault and sexual violence and sexual domination is right there implicit in the history of Western art. It's right there in the art. And um, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that the, the, uh, the male artists behave so badly. Um, and this is not to moralize it, about it, but just to state it as a fact of the content of the art. So that's, you know, that's sort of my my goal, my future goal. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right. So I've got a, let's see here. I've got a couple of really great ones. All right. So can you speak to the illumination that you and the other gorilla girls have had by virtue of knowing or encountering the same people and institutions under both your known and masked identities? Um, you mean, how, how do people, how, how do people in museums uh, respond when you're a gorilla girl versus when you're just an ordinary artist? I think, I think that's, yeah, that's how I'm reading it as <laughs> well. I remember, uh, I remember calling up Richard Armstrong the first time he was at the Guggenheim as a gorilla girl and he answered the phone right away. But it took him weeks to send back my slides when I sent them earlier. So, um, it's kind of weird that we can cut through it all, but it's really great to have a double life and to see how people in power really are, you know, when you're in a position to criticize them versus in a position to need something from them. Mm. So um, it's a fun little game to play. I like that. I've definitely wearing a mask these past eight months. I've, yeah, <laughs> you can kind of get away with a lot of things when people don't recognize you. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see this one. This one's a little bit longer, um, but I liked it a lot. All right. So do you think cultural institutions use the aesthetic aestheticization of your work to dilute your message by embracing you? They make you art. And are you ever worried that by becoming art, partially by exhibiting ephemeral, ephemeral sorry, <laughs> interventions like posters and stickers, it erases the effectiveness of the protest? Well, first of all, I don't think ephemeral things are, um, you know, lack uh, uh, impact. In fact, the great thing about making things that are ephemeral or that can be reproduced, you know, infinitely is that they could exist everywhere. Whereas a, you know, a very precious and valuable painting can only exist in one place at one time and it can be controlled by the person who owns it. Uh, you know, we're happy when thousands of our posters are hanging in college dormitories. Um, so first of all, I don't think that the fact our work is ephemeral and it's reproducible um, has anything to do with its impact. I think it increases its impact. As for being in museums, well, you know, a really good military tactic is to attack the enemy from all sides. And we used to do it from the streets, we still do. Um, and now we get the opportunity to do it from the inside because there have always been really well-intentioned people inside museums who have been afraid to speak up for fear of jeopardizing their careers. And we're really happy to go in and do the dirty work for them um, so that they can just say, oh, those gorilla girls, we just could not predict what they were gonna do. Um, and we're just, we've sort of invaded, you know, invaded the institutions. So I don't think, um, 
although I, you know, I'm sure there are people who would argue the opposite. We don't feel that our work has been aestheticized because it's still pretty rough. And we kind of think of it as a time bomb, you know, as a little bomb sitting on the wall. Um, and we really believe that our portfolios, which have been acquired by 50 museums all over the world, and they're all the same, you know, complete portfolios of our work, we are really happy that they're sitting somewhere in these collections so that a hundred years from now, when someone looks at all the, you know, million dollar fancy sculptures and paintings, they see our work and say, oh my God, that was going on at the same time too. <laughs> we really think of our work not as precious objects, but as a piece of information. And we re I really think of us as being in the knowledge industry. We create knowledge. Mm. All right, so we've got, well, we just had a couple more come in. All right, so I, let's see here. Okay, I'm curious what you think about age and women and getting on gallery walls. It seems like there is a predisposition towards early career or late career. I don't know, I think that yeah. might be more of a statement than a question, but I guess I could, yeah. could you elaborate on any thoughts that you might have around that? Well, I would say yes. Uh, <laughs> our world has a great way of promoting and um, branding things. And right now the art world is really happy to find a few older women who are forgotten in their lifetime and, 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 and sort of rediscovering them and uh, you know giving them all kinds of opportunities, which I'm really happy for. Mm -hmm. But the problem with an art world that's based on the art market and on uh, capitalism is that there can only be a few winners and lots of losers. And we know that culture is more rich than that, that there are many, many different stories. And when museums and collectors want the same five artists all the time, rather than making their own decisions about what, you know, what speaks to them, and without realizing that you know, culture is a really rich, rich and wide um, tapestry of possibilities, uh, I think that we all get hooked in that and artists become nasty and competitive with each other because they know only a few of them can win the lottery. And it happens in school. I mean, all the MFA programs who uh, train student, you know, graduate students to win the lottery, knowing that maybe one every five years will win the lottery. I mean, what if other schools, medical schools or law schools, uh, trained students you know, to mostly fail. Um, the art world is problematic as, as we know it. We really need to, to create more diverse art worlds. And then, and then the work will stand on its own. And actually the older an artist gets, the more you know, work there is, there, the more content there is, and the richer, greater, longer story there is to tell. Sorry, that was long-winded. No, no, that was great. <laughs> this is what we want. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Um, okay, so why, why do you think that the word feminism has such a negative connotation and what can we do to get rid of that negative connotation and maybe even convince people that feminism is a good thing? Well, it has a bad reputation because people are threatened by it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of men and a lot of women too, who feel protected by, uh, you know, patriarchal uh, structures or women who, you know, uh, are in a way uh, uh, internally oppressed, not realizing it. They reject feminism because it's, it challenges, uh, you know, the, the mainstream, the structure, social structure. Um, and I think a lot of women think it makes them you know, unattractive or <laughs> unfriendly, or uh, you know, they won't be liked if they're you know if, if they're strong, you know, strong voiced. I mean, all you had to do was watch that debate the other night between Kamala Harris and, and Mike Pence to realize the privilege he thought he had to speak over the moderator, who was a woman, and to interrupt his uh, his debate partner, who was a woman and to take more time and more air than he was allotted, uh, to realize how threatened many, many people are by women uh, claiming their power. 
Uh, and we all know women have had power for a long time. We've got a, a great deal of power. We have the power of reproduction. Um, so I'm not sure how to change it. Um, there are probably lots of different ways to do it and every culture probably has its own solutions. I, I wouldn't want to say what should happen everywhere, but uh, all you have to do is look around the world and, and, and women um, in this kind of global world we live in, they are empowering themselves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in their own ways. And maybe we have to start in our personal lives and then claim political power in a larger sense and claim political power in the workplace. You know, stand up, you know, stand up to the establishment, um, call out institutional racism, institutional sexism. It's tough and sometimes you pay a price for it, but it's the only way we're gonna push this ball forward. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got, we had a couple more come in. How, do you think you have time for maybe about yeah, three? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Cause some of these are, I love these questions. All right, so this one's um, kind of juicy. What is your opinion? of Ivy League institutions finally addressing the lack of diversity in their introductory art history curriculum? Why only uh, Ivy League universities? <laughs> everywhere. <There. laughs> yeah. I think that, well, I mean, I can't be everywhere. Uh, no one person can be everywhere, but <laughs> certainly uh, we hope that anyone who spends any time on our website will um, have the courage to ask about that. Mm. You know, why, why not? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the education of art history professors because they don't learn it. And actually that would make education very exciting to be in a class where no one knows what the subject matter is week to week. Uh, that it, you know, it's the result of ongoing detective work that the students and, and uh, the professors are doing, you know, all through the semester. That'd be, that would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Right. So I've got, I actually, I've got two questions and they overlap in a lot of ways. So I think I'm going to ask them both because I think the, they might have this, a similar answer. All right. So the first one is, what advice would you give to a fifth grader who wanted to be an activist in the feminist area? And what advice do you have for young art students who wanna apply their art practice to address social change and political topics, but might not know where to start? Oh, well, to the art students, just start looking around. There is so much, uh, there's so much political work right now. There's so many wonderful, um, you know, art groups, um, activist groups. You could go to our web, our website and our Instagram um, account because over this month, we're gonna alternate between um, giving our Instagram uh, account over to uh, artist activist organizations that we admire uh, and let them talk about what they're doing. Uh, and then we're also trying to uh, promote our book which we hope everyone will, will read and buy and sleep with. And, uh, <laughs> I ordered one today. I got one. <laughs> <one. laughs> uh, for the fifth grader, wow. Well, um, I think it depends on um, the environment they're in and what issues are important to them. You know, a fifth grader uh, of color, a BIPOC fifth grader, has a very different life experience than you know, a suburban white uh, fifth grader. Uh, I think they have to, certainly if, uh, you know, a fifth grader would have to find some kindred spirits to help them and guide them and protect them, uh, but realize that um, the change is something that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, sometimes things go three steps forward, two steps back. I mean, look at the last two, presidential um, administrations we've had, you know, how far we've slid back. Um, but I would say, just keep it up. I mean, we like to say, try one thing. If it works, try another. And if it doesn't work, try another anyway. Just keep chipping away. When we started this, we were just angry. I had no idea it would be a 30 year commitment. <laughs> I had other ideas for my life. 
But it got so interesting, I couldn't give it up and I wouldn't give it up. It wasn't part of my plan, um, but it's been a thrilling and wonderful ride. And um, I just feel so privileged to be able to do it. All right, so do, I think, do we have time for maybe two more questions? Sure. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so are there any Gorilla Girls outside of New York City? Yes. All right. Do they live? Where Where do they live? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't, I guess we can't say specific. But <laughs> well, we are certainly bi-coastal. We have West Coast Gorilla Girls. And, you know, we like to think that some of our supporters think of themselves as Gorilla Girls in their hearts. So I think that means we probably have thousands of supporters all over the world who, you know, would be willing to put up a sticker for us if we could get a sticker to them. Mm. And please download our stickers, download our, our work, put them up everywhere. That's when we realized that people cared about us outside of the United States when we first had a, uh, a website and we would start to get letters from women in the Emirates, women in Pakistan, you know, women in Vietnam telling us that, you know, they came across our work and it was, you know, they found some of the same situations, especially in art schools, studying to be artists, and what could they do, you know, to join us? All right. Well, this is a really good segue into, um, I've, I've gotten this question about six times, so I have to ask it. Um, are you taking any new recruits? <laughs> well, there's good news and there's bad news. Let me tell you the bad news. Uh, no, we're not. You know, if, if we, um, if we considered everyone who wanted to join us, we wouldn't have time to work. We would be constantly interviewing people. Um, that's the bad news. Uh, and, and actually, we are, well, I have to admit, we are smaller people than you imagine. We change in, in size a lot, but it's not easy to do this kind of um, focused work uh, in a large group. Um, so that's the bad news. But the good news is you don't need to be a gorilla girl to do work like we do. Um, you know, find your own, you know, find, find a bunch of friends, kindred spirits who, who feel the same as you do. Decide what your, your targets are, what your issues are, and then just start messaging about it. Um, do what we do. You don't need you know, to be a gorilla girl. You can make up your own crazy anonymous um, identity, your own crazy get up. I mean, actually, it's more powerful to have many um, feminist mask Avengers rather than just the girl girls. Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, this is, um, you may have just answered this next question, um, but I, I feel like it's a really good question to end um, the Q and A with. How can we change the art world right now? Well, by getting after it tomorrow and <laughs> speaking up and, you know, we didn't ask anyone's permission. And, and we didn't know where, where we would go. We just started doing things. And what worked, we pursued. Um, so start tomorrow thinking about what you can do, uh, either to change the art world or create a new one that you want to be part of. I mean, we've done that. We don't, we don't show in galleries. We don't have fancy collectors. You know, we sell our posters for thirty dollars a piece. Um, we didn't ask anyone's permission, and I'm really happy that we have sort of created a different different economic uh, model for artists. You know, we're not, we're, you know, we're not trying, we're not we're not trying to make million dollar work. We just want to we want to get our our message out in whatever way we can. So. Um, I would say, if you don't like the art world you're in, make an art world that you want to be part of. I love that. I think that's probably uh, it for the evening, isn't it? Yeah, that, I think that was a great answer. Um, <laughs> okay. Alfreda, thank you so, so, so much for taking the time to answer these questions. Um, do you have any final words before we close out the evening? Well, good luck, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Please go to our website. Good luck with whatever efforts you are uh, involved in to change the world. And don't forget to vote.
very important this year, especially in South Carolina. Now, I wouldn't dare tell you how to vote, but I'm sure you know what I'm thinking. Bye-bye. <laughs>